The spirit of creativity lives in all of us. It compels us to move forward. So tell me, do you love someone? I, love I paint with colors. I paint with numbers. I paint with words. I sculpt in 3D. I sculpt in code. I sculpt young minds to go further. I design skyscrapers. I design in mixed reality. I share ideas. I share experiences. I compose symphonies of music. I compose symphonies of science. What we create is more than just our work. It is our passion. Defining us as individuals and shaping the future we share. Welcome to a world where every person is empowered to achieve more. So tell me, do you love Thank you. Hello, Helsinki. All right, welcome to the Microsoft Build Tour 2017. We've got an amazing day planned for you today. My name is Shen Chohan. I'm a senior program manager at Microsoft. I have no friends, so I'm going to shamelessly plug my Twitter handle here as well so you can all follow me. Uh, so what I want to do today is just give you a, a brief overview in this keynote about the Microsoft platforms and where the momentum is and where we'll be going. So we'll be talking about the client and the cloud. So let's start with the momentum of the cloud. So we've been focused heavily on innovation and trust. And the results are pretty telling. You can see here that we have 90% of the Fortune 500 using the Microsoft Cloud. We also have large companies using software as a service on Azure, such as Adobe, Autodesk, and Avid. Let's briefly give you the momentum about Windows 10. So Windows 10 now has more than 500 million active users. And what's really great about this is we have 300 million active users using Windows on average more than three and a half hours per day. This makes Windows the most used version of Windows around the world. So we're really proud of this. And it's great to see the customer satisfaction is also the best that we've ever had on Windows. But this is actually part of a longer story. And the next phase that we'll be talking about will be the full creators update. So from now on in the keynote, when I refer to some of the technology you'll see here, I'll be talking primarily about what's going to be happening in the full creators update. So like I said, we definitely have a very busy day. We're covering a lot of topics in the keynote today. And I just want to make you aware that if you like anything or you see anything, please feel free to uh, tweet, post, share your photos. Tell your family, your friends, animals, cats, dogs, whatever it is. Uh, and please make sure you use the MS Build Tour hashtag, just so people around the world can also see what's going on here in Helsinki. So let's start with the first topic, making Windows the best developer PC on the planet. So we do a lot of work in Windows 10 and Visual Studio 2017 to make sure that Windows is the best place for you as a developer. Now, as a developer that's going to write a Windows 10 app, we've been heavily investing in the universal Windows platform. This is a platform of choice if you're going to build a Windows 10 application. But you know, we know that not all of you are there yet. And that doesn't matter, because we like you no matter whatever developer you are, including web, C++, and .NET. So let's just do a bit of a deep dive into those three topics here. I want to first discuss the web. So we have the Progressive Web App, which is a technology that allows you to deploy your application across the platform and across Windows devices. This includes the phone, the PC, and the Xbox, and more. This was built on top of our hosted web app that we've been working on on Windows. And we've been working with the W3C to make sure that this standard becomes available for everyone. Now, I won't talk any more about this, because we're going to have a full session later on by Jeff. Um, and he'll be able to talk to you more about some of the exciting things going on there. We also know web developers like to use Bash. Do we have any Bash users here? 
Hey, cool. So you're probably aware that we had a Windows subsystem for Linux uh, with Ubuntu, and we made some great headwind with that. And in the full creators update, I'm proud to announce we're going to have two, no, two new distros. So OpenSUSE and Fedora. This means, as a web developer, you can use whichever distro works best for you. Now let's move on. So any C++ developers in the house? OK, cool, we've got a few. So we know there are C++ developers that write mission-critical applications. And we've made investments here as well. So you can profit from some of the great things we've been doing. So we made sure that Visual Studio now loads C++ projects 17 times more faster and has a 2.8 times smaller memory footprint. We've also added additional features like a CMake, which now comes built in. And what I'm happy to announce is that with Visual C++ for Linux, you can now debug using the Windows subsystem for Linux. So this is kind of pretty interesting and pretty cool, because what you can now do is your Visual C++ can now target the Linux distro. And you can actually build, test, and compile and run your Linux apps directly on your Windows 10 PC. OK, and finally, .NET developers. Please tell me you have .NET developers. Cool, awesome. More of you, good. <laughs> so as you know, we released .NET Core, and we've been having great community engagement here. You can see just a few. So we've got Red Hat, Samsung, Unity, and Google. And they've been helping make sure that .NET Core is working cross-platform. We also have announced the .NET Core Preview 2. This is the first implementation of .NET Standards 2. But there was actually something missing of part of this story, too, because one of the platforms wasn't there. Well, it is now. So .NET Standard 2 will also be available for UWP. Now, when we talk about the investments here, the .NET UWP APIs have had a 60% growth. So to give you a rough number, that's about over 18,000 new members that will be added to .NET Framework. This will make it really easy for you to build your your applications and your code to be portable across your desktop, your Xamarin, and, of course, your UWP applications. But what about XAML? Do we have XAML developers in the house? Got a few? Cool. I think you're all very shy, House Sinky, because technically I've covered everything, and not everyone's put their hand up. So, <laughs> so let's talk a bit about XAML-based technologies. So this will probably look familiar to some of you. You'll see on the left here we have Xamarin Forms. Uh, and it's got controls that you're used to, but they've got different names. So we have stack layout, label, and entry. And on the right, we have UWP XAML. And obviously, there we have a stack panel, a text box, and a text box. So very similar to what you also use in WPF. Now, wouldn't it be great if we had one XAML to sort of rule them all? Yeah? No? Well, the good news is we're actually planning on doing this using the XAML standard 1.0. So later this fall, uh, we're going to try and uh, actually, at the moment, it's currently a specification, but we're planning on releasing XAML standard one. And what we would like you to do is visit this URL, check out the specification, and actually provide feedback and input into our features. At the moment, we'd love to know what you find important and what you don't, so the release is really meaningful to you. So if I take all the things I've talked about with the XAML standard and we talk about the .NET standard as well, this means that when you're building your applications cross-platform, your code and your UI can actually be transported across the various UIs, as well as cloud. So it's not just all about investments with code. We've also made investments in our ID. So Visual Studio 2017 has some great new features coming up. And I want to show you just one of my favorites, which is the Xamarin Live Player. So let me switch over to my machine here. So as you can see, I've got a just a XAML-based application. This looks pretty familiar. And I've also got my iPhone here. So this is this physical device here. Now, one thing I want to do here is I actually want to make sure that I can connect the two devices. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how easy it now is with the Xamarin Live Player to actually connect directly to Visual Studio. So I'm going to go to Tools, Xamarin Live Player. Manage devices. And what I can do here is on my iPhone, I'm going to select pair to Visual Studio. As I do that, it's going to bring up the camera, and I'm now just going to bring that over the QR code. And it's going to happen pretty quickly, hopefully, so as it sees it. And there we go. So what you're now seeing is it's going to go up to Xamarin service, and the two are going to connect. So you can now see that my device is connected. 
So I'm going to close this down from here. I'm going to select the build iPhone player, the one I've just connected to. And I'm now just going to run this. So as I click that, and it goes across to the phone. And there we go. So the nice thing about this is it's really easy to set up. But there's more. If any of you have actually used the XAML applications, you'll probably know that we have the Edit and Live Continue feature in Visual Studio. Well, actually, we've also brought that across to Xamarin applications, too. So if I go to the Xamarin Live Player menu here and go run Live Current View, you can see this is my application. And notice how quick that was. This went straight to the phone. What you're seeing is actually live code that's been executed and ran. So let me preview this to you. So I'm going to take this header here. I'm just going to drag that out here. And what you'll see is shortly, you'll update. Now, this isn't just applied to the XAML. Um, I can also do it here. So I'm hoping the Finnish people will correct me if I've got this wrong. <laughs> Hopefully, it's OK. And I'm also going to change this background to orange so we can just see that. I can make changes on the fly with my XAML and my C Sharp. This is a really powerful feature. Now, let me just switch back. You can applaud. It's OK. <laughs> <laughs> OK, the next thing I want to talk about is the investments we're making in the Windows Store. So for us, it's really, really important to have a great store because we want you to be as successful as possible on our platform. So we have been making investments in these three core pillars. Firstly, awareness. So the Windows Store currently has 500 million monthly visits. This means it's really easy to make sure that Users can get your application as easy as possible. We've had five times increase of the promotions that are also in the store. And later on, we'll be also be offering the notion of actually buying physical products to the store. The other thing we offer is monetization. And although we have the usual in-app purchases and bundles, we also have things like subscriptions and convergence of the Xbox. And finally, the developer experience. Developer experience isn't just about writing code. It's also about the deployment, the maintenance, and the updating. So we offer great features like flighting and automation. So from directly from your build servers, you can use the APIs and directly deploy to the store. And finally, reporting and stack traces, because it's incredibly vital for you to actually understand where your application is failing in health metrics. And we'll talk more about this as well in the UWP session later. But first, I just want to say a big thank you to a lot of you in the audience who've actually been and shipped stuff to the store. I think it's vitally important to recognize the success of these people as well. And we're, I just want to also bring you to show some of the new people that are actually joined in the store. So people always think a store is a consumer place. Well, actually, that's not true. You can see here, SAP are using the Windows Store for business as a way to use the volume licensing and also ways to integrate into their customers' MDM solutions to easily provide their digital boardroom to their customers. They've seen great opportunities in the Windows Store, as well as some of the other large partners. So let's have a quick look at some of those. So we have iTunes from Apple. And Autodesk have released Sketchbook last year. Now, what's interesting about Autodesk is they've actually seen a 35% month-on-month growth. This is more than what they get currently on their other mobile platforms. And they're using some of our subscription-based APIs, so it allows them to actually bill users as and when they need. Now, the store isn't just for external developers. We actually use it internally as well. Actually, Office Now will ship as part of a store app. And I just want to give you a quick demo to show you how this works. So are you ready for it? Cool. This is it. Because actually, the slide I'm running today is actually the Centennial desktop bridge version of the store. So let me close down my deck. They, should, they always say, when you're presenting, never close down your deck. It's disastrous, and it's a big stage nightmare because you'll lose stuff if I click the wrong button. But I'm going to take the risk. So here you can see that actually, if you look at what PowerPoint's running, Notice that it's not in the C drive program files Microsoft Office folder anymore. It's now in the Windows apps. So it's sitting alongside all the other Windows apps. So you can clearly see that UWP and the stories providing Office the things they need to make sure that they get Office into the hands of people with the right updates all the time. 
All right. Oh. All right, so next, I want to talk about the Microsoft Graph. Who knows what the Microsoft Graph is? Yay, it means I can actually talk about it. Who has more than one device? Who has more than two devices? More than three devices? More than four devices? I'm still getting almost 50% of the room. OK, good. Who finds it really annoying that they can't always work from one device to another really seamlessly? Cool. So let me explain what the Microsoft Graph does. We know you all have more than one device. We also know that you also do more than one thing on those devices. And we all know that you have more than one file on your device that you use. Well, the Microsoft Graph is a way that allows you, the developer, to actually go and help developers make sure, uh, help rather users make sure that they always have your content and your engagement on the right device at the right time. So as a developer, you can use the Project Chrome SDKs to make sure that as users go between their devices, your application is there at the right time in the same place where they left off before. So let me just show you a quick example, because this is probably easier to explain uh, based on how we at Microsoft do this. So I want to introduce you to Timeline. This will be a new feature coming to Windows. And this is a great example of how Windows Shell is actually using the, the Microsoft Graph APIs. So let's walk through a very quick demo here. So here you can see I have my Surface Studio, which I believe is coming to you tomorrow. Uh, I'm going to click on the task switcher there. And you can see all the items that I've been working on on my machine. You can see I can scroll up to see things that I've been working on on previous days. But also, the great thing about Timeline is I can actually search my timeline on things I've been working on. So it just so happens I'm doing a kitchen remodel here. I'm going to click the kitchen remodel. And watch what's going to happen. Notice how PowerPoint has opened. And on top of that, it's at the right place. Now, what's key here is that, like yourselves, I have many devices. And one of these is a Surface Book. Now, thanks to Cortana, who's across many devices and platforms, as I actually go to my Surface Book, Cortana's going to recognize that I was working on that PowerPoint deck and a few of the files that I had open. So she's going to say, hey, I've got something for you. Are you interested? And as I click Cortana, notice how I end up going straight to the same page. And this is vitally important, because this means that the user is always in the right flow. It also means that as a developer, you get a great engagement. So life isn't all about PowerPoint. Well, my life isn't anyway. Uh, so I also do a bit of reading on news. Uh, so I just want to show you something here. So you can see I've got a news app open. And it's, I think it's about a village in Kentucky. And as I then go to my mobile device, you'll notice because Cortana is cross-platform, she also gets the notification. And when I open up the notification, it takes me directly to the same article that I was working on. Uh, so I can then carry on reading my news article on the go. Now, what's really impressive here is that if the application isn't installed on that device, it doesn't matter, because Cortana will directly launch you directly to the product description page in that particular store. This means that you'll get the greatest engagement across all your platforms. Now, the new thing I want to introduce here as well is the cloud-powered clipboard. Who's ever tried to get something from one document on one machine and paste it in another document in another machine, right? It's so painful. It's incredibly painful. The first thing you do is you work out, is there an easy way to do this? Then you realize there isn't, so you send yourself a mail. Then you wait for your mail to arrive on another machine, and chances are it probably hasn't got Outlook so using the, the cloud and all sorts. Well, we sort of solved this with the cloud pad clipboard. So I just want to walk you through again another brief demo here. So I'm going to go back to my Surface Studio with the kitchen supplier here. So I'm going to go back to slide five. I'm going to select the first store supplier. I'm not going to copy this to the clipboard. I'm going to go to my Android device running Google Maps, because I want to know where it is this store. Notice I'm using the swipe keyboard, which has access to the Microsoft Graph. So the store was directly there, and I was able to search for the exact location of where it was. The great thing here is that Windows is a PC that allows you to basically run across all your, rather, Windows PCs love all your devices, and the Microsoft Graph is just a great example of how we're working together across these different platforms. Now, to give you a bit more of a an insight into the Microsoft Graph, I want to invite a great colleague of mine on stage, Etienne Magra, and also Larry Liebman to give you a bit more. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jen. 
Hello everyone, my name is Etienne Margraff. I'm a senior dev engineer at Microsoft. So you just saw that Windows is adding more and more information to the Microsoft's graph. This enables very rich personal and business experiences. At Microsoft, we use the graph a lot in a lot of applications. As you can see here, we use this in Office 365, Skype for Business, Dynamics, and also Microsoft Teams. Before going any further, I would like you to have a look at something that was built by a partner named TACT. They're bringing AI intelligence into CRM experiences. To do this, they're using Microsoft Graph and Teams. Larry, up to you. Thanks, Etienne. TACT is a partner of Microsoft that's building a solution to help its sales professionals access the information they care about in Office, in Dynamics, in a very easy conversational way. They've built a bot that uses the bot framework, and you can access that bot through Microsoft Teams to get at that information using the Microsoft Graph. We've been talking about the Microsoft Graph, and it's important. Have any of you worked with the Microsoft Graph before? It's been around for a little while. Uh, we've, we've been extending the Microsoft Graph. It's now available to use. It's one, it gives you one single API endpoint that you can use to get at all your information in Office, Dynamics, Bing, uh, just as we were saying here. And we're going to look through how TACT has done that with this bot that they've created. Here I am in Microsoft Teams. And in Microsoft Teams, you'll see that the TACT bot has sent me a proactive message about an account executive at a company that we work with. It's using the Bing Knowledge Graph to do this. It's searching periodically to see if there are any, anything, any news going on with companies that we care about. Now, because of Microsoft Graph, the TAC bot is able to actually give us some options about things we might want to do with this notification. One here is searching Office 365. And what it's going to do when I click on this button is actually use the Microsoft Graph to go out and see if we've had any interaction with this executive in the past. And it looks like we have, because it came back and told us it found 10 references to this executive in the past. And this is from searching it through chats, files, notes, and meetings, all through the graph. Now, they not only did that, they actually went further. Because we may want to know, do we have a good relationship with this person or not? In order to do that, they conducted a sentiment analysis. Now, we provide a series of APIs we'll talk about a little bit later on, the Cognitive Services APIs. And you can call something the Text Analytics Service and ask it for the sentiment, an analysis of the tone of the conversation. And here, we've sent it this information about these, these conversations. And it's come back and said, we have 84% of those conversations are positive. Imagine the possibilities here. So because we've got a positive relationship with this executive, I want to find I want to connect with her in LinkedIn, and I'd like to create a lead in Dynamics. TACT is giving me the option to do that all directly here within Teams. I can click Search LinkedIn, and it will search for people who match that name in LinkedIn. And it will return them as a series of cards here. Once I've found the correct Julia Spears, I can go and click Connect. And TACT will connect to LinkedIn and have LinkedIn issue a connection request. And at the same time, it will call Microsoft Graph to create a lead in Microsoft Graph. TACT has also extended Teams here so that I can actually go view the lead on this special TACT tab that they've created in Teams. Here it's showing all the information about what TACT has done for me, including the alerts as well as the leads that it created. Now, the number one thing you want to do with a lead is actually go contact that person. So I need a reminder to go contact that person at some time. And I want that reminder not just to go to me, but I also want it to go to all of the people at my company who have collaborated with me on this project before. TACT is giving me a number of options here around creating that follow-up reminder. I can click here this top collaborators button. 
And what it's doing is it will actually call the Microsoft Graph, find out who those individuals are, and send that back to me, and then call Microsoft Graph again and find an open calendar appointment for us. Now, my calendar is pretty busy, as you can see here. And uh, TACT has gone around and looked for availability. But it can also then go forward and actually schedule the appointment directly in my calendar and the calendar of these other collaborators. And you'll see here in a minute. Need to refresh my calendar. And here's the appointment it made for me. The Microsoft Graph opens up the universe of all the Office 365 data in your organization to be extended and enhanced through your own line of business applications. Let's take a look at exactly how we did this in code. Very, very simple. Here in TypeScript, you'll see we have an object for the conversations. Because the graph needs authentication here, the first thing I had to do is actually get a token. Once I have that token, it's one single HTTP request calling that URL for the graph endpoint for groups and searching on that text. It sends back a JSON object that contains all of those conversations. Let's look at how we did the sentiment analysis. Again, one single HTTP request. We send it the JSON objects, and it comes back with a sentiment score. It's that simple. So if you'd like more information about how to use Microsoft Graph, uh, there's a session by Yina Renis that was at the Build Conference last month, as well as graph.microsoft.com, which is the best place to go just to get started. Back to you, Etienne. Thanks, Larry. So let's move on to Azure now. Azure is helping you reach your users where they are. We now have 34 Azure regions, and we announced six more. But Azure is also about trust. We have 53 compliance agreements, including Sovereign Cloud. So you and your users can use Azure in complete trust. We always bring more features to Azure, and having more and more tech in there is great, but that's not enough. And we are listening to you, and we are focusing Azure innovation on your needs. What I want to do now is to show you some of the new things that we have in the Azure portal and in Visual Studio. Larry, up to you again. Thanks, Etienne. Here we are in the Azure portal. You've heard about how Azure is delivering innovation customized to your needs designed for results, all inside a trusted cloud. We do this through our management stack and the developer tools that, we guide, that help guide you to success. The portal is the single place where we can manage and monitor those applications across the entire surface area of Azure. Now, to make this easier for you, we've given you the ability to customize your portal. And so you'll see here we have a custom portal that we've created for our visitors app, which I'll just switch to here. Now, this custom view of the portal allows me to customize and put exactly the items that I need to see when managing this specific application. So I have my list of resources that are leveraged by that web application. I have database utilization. And then I have here uh, two different CPU and memory graphs based on different service plans. Up here, I've got an application map. Now, Application Insights creates these application maps. And what the application map enables me to do is see uh, real-time information about the monitoring and the analytics around the performance of my application. Now, as I mentioned, this is all based on open APIs. 
And you can do a lot of amazing things with those open APIs. One of the things that we've done is we've created a new cloud shell. We've noticed that a lot of developers are interested in using the command line. And we announced last year the Azure command line, Azure CLI. Uh, just recently released a second version. Uh, but folks told us that you know, it's not always instantly available wherever they might be, and it might not be configured for the resources they need. So what we've done here is we've announced the addition of the Azure command line directly in the portal. And I need to reinitialize the portal. <clears throat> the very first time you start this, it's actually going to go and configure your cloud storage. Uh, you have a cloud storage account that's associated with this. I'm actually in a bash shell, a live bash shell. I can type ls and see what's in my directory. I can type top and see the processes that are running here. This is already logged in. It's already configured for the resources that I'm using in this portal instance. I can go and do things like use the az command to access Azure. So I can look at my VM list. You'll see it returns a list of uh, the list of virtual machines that I might have running in this instance. Comes back as a JSON object, but and that's useful for some purposes. But I might want to actually uh, see that in a more uh, a nicer format, like a table. And if I have a very large set of Azure virtual machines, I might even need to be able to actually go through that and grep for a specific string like Europe. And it will return that string there. Just typing the az command will show me the full list of commands available to me here directly in the shell. So this is pretty amazing. But we know that. You know, a lot of folks are mobile these days. And you may need to access your Azure instance while you're on your phone. So we announced a new Azure management app for mobile. Here it's running on iOS. And I can go directly in there, and you'll see all of my resources are listed just as they are in the portal. And I have my visitor's web app here, just as I have it in the portal. I can go in and manage my visitor's web app. I can see even graphs around metrics and properties around the operation of that web app. I can stop the web app and restart it directly here. This is all, again, built on those same open APIs of the portal. But it wouldn't be Azure. It wouldn't be really, really cool if I couldn't also go use the command line directly from my mobile app. So now, for the first time, wherever you are, you can then go and access your, your, virtual, your virtual machines, your web applications, and so, have, so forth directly from your mobile device. OK. Now, when I was looking here a minute ago, I noticed a problem in my application map. I see here that, and I'm going to actually expand into my application map to see what's going on. Because I've got 3.2% failures here on my web application. And uh, I, don't, I don't like that. So you know, what I can do then is, is click here to drill in to that web application. And you'll see here it's listing out the problems. Now, I don't care about failed responses as much, but I have not seen an out of range exception. And uh, that may be something that I need to go investigate. So clicking on there shows me this, the properties of that exception. And I can directly create a new work item in Visual Studio Team Services if I need to assign this to someone else to go work on. Uh, but it's also showing some things like a minimal view of the call stack. Uh, but one, if I'm the developer working on this, I might want to just go directly in and see this debug snapshot. This is a new feature in Azure. We are now providing uh, Application Insights has the ability to automatically generate these debug snapshots when it detects certain types of problems. And then a developer can go look at it after the fact and go through the call stack, go through the local variables that were in play and what their values were. Uh, but you know, as a developer, I really want to debug my web application. I want to understand what happened here. And what we're enabling you to do is download that snapshot and open it directly in Visual Studio. 
Now, I want to debug the web application, but it's very problematic to try to debug a web application that's in production. Um, because you're going to break the web application and need to go in and see what's going on, and that's going to affect users who are trying to use the web app. Well, now with this debug snapshot, I can actually debug against the snapshot and see what was going on at the time the error took place. So I'm going to go in here in Visual Studio, and I'm going to debug with managed only since that was a managed error. And you'll see here it's showing me exactly where the application broke on this parts array. If I take a look at the parts array, if I hover over it here, it's pretty small, but we can zoom in. Well, that's not going to help. But what we've got here is an array, and the array has one member, uh, you'll see. But I'm actually calling two members here in the object, and that's the problem, because uh, obviously um, we're out of range if you're calling the second member of an array that only has one member. So very easy error to find, but uh, sometimes that can be useful too. So that's debugging against the debug snapshot. Last thing I want to show you, we talk about trust. Just now, we've announced a new security center in Azure that will dynamically assess your web application for security problems. It's generated a list of recommendations for me here, 17 recommendations. I can go in and take a look. And you'll see they, they fall over a large range of things, like adding a next generation firewall, or applying system updates, or disk encryption, uh, and so forth. And this is a very easy way for me to get more information about how I can improve the security of my web application. The other thing we have here, though, is this dynamic view of the attacked resources. Some of my resources have been attacked. If I go in and look at one of my virtual machines here, you'll see it gives me explicit detail about exactly what type of attacks took place. Uh, and you'll even see things here like a, a brute force attack. So clearly, I need to do something about these problems. So that's what I've got to show you about what's new in Azure today. Um, but I want to point out, before we go back to Etienne here, that these innovative tools, uh, they make you more productive. They'll help you get results. But they're not just about adding features. This is about making you more impactful at solving the specific problems that you told us that you have. So I hope you enjoyed this little whirlwind tour of what's new in Azure. Back Thank to you, Thank you, Etienne. Larry. That was awesome. So Azure is awesome. You can do a lot of things in here. As a developer, you can use basic infrastructure services like compute, network, or storage. You can also use highly engineered services like the platform as a service services. What I want to do now is walk you through some of the innovations that we've been doing lately on Azure. And we're going to talk first about data. Data is at the core of every of your developments. And because of this, we released a few months ago SQL Server 2017. It's the most intelligent and the fastest database that we've created so far. And because we know that you like to run on wh wherever you, you prefer, you can run the SQL Server database on Linux, Windows, and Docker. We also have a version of, of SQL Server Database on the cloud, which is Azure SQL Database. And you can have, in 60 seconds, a fully functional database available, which is high available. And you don't have to configure nothing. So we, we've got some feedback from developers wanting to have an easy way to migrate data from on-premises to the cloud. And this is why we released the Azure Database Migration Service which helps you doing this seamlessly from a SQL Server 2017 database or other databases such as Oracle systems. So we know that some developers love SQL, some other love other databases. This is why we also release two more services, one for MySQL and one for Postgres. This is the exact same. In 60 seconds, you can have a new database running, and you can use your existing code, drivers, and tooling that you like. Or you can also use Azure 
tools. And here you can see in the, in the portal that Larry showed you before that we are restoring a Postgres database directly in the, in the portal. We also announced another database, which is Cosmos DB. It's the first globally distributed and multimodal database. The way it works is that you can choose the model you want. You can have documents, key value, and then you can access this data using the API you like, DocumentDB, MongoDB, and even Spark. The other part of Cosmos DB, which is really important and great, is that it's globally distributed, meaning that we take care of having the data near your users, and we also take care of other things like uh, indexing it. And lastly, what is really awesome about this is that it's the only database with SLAs that you can see here on the screen. And you can monitor these SLAs directly from the Azure portal. So let's move on to compute now. There are more and more people loving containers, and we love containers at Microsoft. This is why we want you to be able to host them in Azure in the way you prefer. You can use web apps, you can use Service Fabric, or you can use one of the well-known uh, cluster management tool, such as Kubernetes, Mesos, or Docker Swarm, using Azure Container Service. We also released new tools inside of Visual Studio 2017 to help you debug, test, and even have end-to-end -end DevOps, DevOps processes. And there is going to be a session today about this, so you will know more into details. If you don't want to take care, or if you just want to take care about your code, you want to go serverless. On Azure, this is Azure Functions. Azure Functions is a way for you to upload some code on Azure and then run it whenever you want. And you have everything that you expect that you need to. You will have uh, debugging, local debugging, local um, uh, developing also. You will have CI, CD, and application insights. And you can run them yourself, or you can let Logic Apps doing this using workflows and events. So having Azure in the cloud managed by Microsoft is great, but it's required you to have it locally on premises. This is Azure Stack. One of one, a good example of this is when you want to manage a lot, a lot of data, but you don't want to be dependent on the bandwidth of your connection. You can have some services locally on-premises managing all your data, and then you can still use Azure services such as machine learning to handle and do stuff on this data. One example is Carnival. They're, they have a fleet of boats, and they're managing this fleet with Azure, but when the boat is at sea, then they have a poor connectivity. So they actually have Azure Stack on the boats to manage some data and some services, and they sync back to Azure when they have a better connection. The last thing I wanted to talk to you about is AI. AI is great. To be able to do anything in this space, you have to basically have three things. Big compute, powerful algorithm, and massive data. And guess what? We have all this on Microsoft. We have the cloud for the big compute, we have Microsoft Graph for the massive data, and we have engineers and researchers in Microsoft Research working on algorithm and AI innovation. innovation. So our mission is to take all this complex algorithm to you in an easy way to consume. And to do this, we released two years ago Cognitive Services. It's exactly this. It's a way for you to access AI, the power of AI, with really simple APIs. And we've released some new in this area, like custom vision service that you can train to recognize what you want and the, the image that you want. You also have to check out Cognitive Services Labs. This is where you have all the new preview services available before they are available publicly. Cognitive services is great, but you will need to use more services from Azure to do AI. You can use 
the database and services, all the tooling we provide, and also the bot service, which most of the time requires AI in the background. That was everything I wanted to talk to you about today. Thank you very much. And back to you, Chen. Uh, thank you, Etienne. Some really cool stuff there. Oh, no, we're on the last section. But yay, it's really cool. So uh, I want to talk to you about some really cool stuff in the, in the last final closing bits of the keynote, fluent design and mixed reality. So as you know, I showed you all the various different types of Windows devices out there, from the small IoT devices to the desktop PC, all the way to holographic stuff. So the key thing here is our design system has now been updated to adapt across these various form factors. So rather than just develop applications and have a design system for the 2D screen, we now have adapted using Microsoft Fluent Design up to a 3D screen for your 3D devices. So let me just give you a trailer video to show you what it's a bit about. What do you guys think? Cool. So hopefully most of you recognize the device in the middle, the HoloLens. But I also just want to introduce some of the other devices that are coming to the mixed reality family, such as the Asus, the Lenovo, and the HP devices. Now, when people think mixed reality, they always think, man, that must be so complicated to develop. Well, I want to prove to you that this is not the case. I want to show you with a demo that actually building mixed reality apps can be really simple. So I'm going to invite my most glamorous assistant, Vladimir, to come on stage and uh, help do a demo here. Right. Isn't she so beautiful? Uh, all right, cool. So when developing a mixed reality app, the first thing I want to show you is Paint 3D. As the name suggests, it's like paint, but to be 3D. Uh, so what we're going to do here is we're going to search a, a model, because that's the first thing you need to do when you're actually developing a, a mixed reality app. But the key thing here is I wanted to make sure that I really, really, really engaged with the audience here. So I wanted something very finished. So I managed to find this. Uh, and the alien's name is Becca. I think I pronounced that correctly. Uh, and we're going to use Becca as our example uh, to how to make a reality app. So you can see here, Vlad's got Becca on screen. And now what he's going to do is he's going to export this to an FBX. This makes it readable with a 3D format. And he saved this now. And he's going to go to a scenario that most mixed reality developers are used to uh, using Unity and the Vuforia SDK. He's going to grab Pekka, and he's going to put the lovely alien on screen. And now what you're going to see is as he just rotates around, he's now going to export this into a universal Windows application. So you see here, he's got universal selected XAML application. So he's now going to export that, and he's going to have a Visual Studio project. Now, the great thing here is, because it's exported as a UWP, it means he's got access to all the APIs on the platform. So in this case, he's going to use the speech APIs. So when he says jump, hopefully Pekka will jump. And when he says stop, there's no real action for stop. But he just won't do anything to stop. So let's have a, a quick look at this demo here. Jump. 
Top. All right, wonderful. Now, thank you. So, the other thing we wanted to do was we can take this Visual Studio project and now deploy it to a HoloLens. So, what we're going to do is, because obviously you can't see what I'm seeing through the HoloLens, uh, we've recorded a video yesterday in the same environment, so Vlad here modeling the HoloLens. Um, we'll just show you what happens when he deploys that through to the Holo. So you can see this is the Unity application again. And as it loads up, you can see this, Becca. OK. Now, spatial mapping. Vlad here is doing spatial mapping. So the HoloLens can work out its environment. Because now we're not using the Fourier SDK. We need to understand where the floor is. So when Pekka falls, it doesn't fall through the floor. And there we go. And then we're going to use the UWP APIs. Jump. I like the fact the highlight of my presentation is watching alien jump. <laughs> so, thank you. So I'd like to also sh show you a couple of the devices as well that are coming later this year. So this is the Acer headset. Um, it's such a great model look. It's brilliant. Um, so this is right, $299, uh, and there'll be something for you to play with. Now, I want to switch over to that. OK. So we know on these headsets that 360 videos are really popular. In fact, built in Windows 10, our movies and TV app has 360 videos available for you to watch. So what I want to show you is a partner that we have called Magix. And they actually allow you to do video editing on 360 degree videos. And here you can see the Win32 app actually you know, enable enable editing of those videos. But what they thought would be really cool was, imagine editing a 360 video in, a, in an environment of mixed reality where you can actually edit the video while wearing the headset so you can see all around you. Well, this is something they're current, currently developing. So why don't we do a quick demo of this? So here you can see Vlad's going to go and connect his piece of headset. OK, and he's going to load up the application. Uh, so as always with hardware, we always have a bit of fun connecting stuff together. All righty. So here you can see the Magix video editor. So let me explain a bit about what you're seeing in the UI here. These spheres are actually the 360 video. So you can see he's got four of them. And what you see in the environment now as he looks around is actually you're in the 360 video itself. Isn't this cool? So now what we want to do is at the moment there's not much action happening. So Vlad's going to scrub through the video to try and make sure that you only see the best bits of the video by splitting it and cutting it. Notice how you get this, the splicing of the video. So you, you get the box. This is to make sure that on my keynote, Vlad doesn't throw up everywhere on the floor. Uh, so he's going to find the right point and he's going to stop it. And now he's going to use the tools to go and actually do the trim. So the first thing he's going to do is he's going to call up the trim command on, from the toolbox. And now he's already got the second sphere selected. That. And now you've seen he split it into two. Now we don't need the item on the left because that was the stuff happened before. So he's now going to delete that. So now he's deleted it. Now when he runs the film, it's going to start from here and you'll get to see the video. Cool. What do you guys think? All right. So I, we know we raced through a lot of stuff in this keynote. We talked about a lot of things. And what I want to do in just this final closing slide is just give you a bit of call to action as to what you guys can do today. So the first thing is modernize your app. We showed you a mixture of apps you know, from the UWP native to the Office apps, so the various technologies using PWA. Um, if you're in one of those camps, just try and build it and see what you think. The other thing is we're always listening. You know, we want to hear your feedback. 
So please contribute to the .NET XAML standard. We want to make sure that we get these things right. And the only way we can do that is understand your scenarios so we can help. The third thing is bring your apps to the store. We talked a bit about the store in the keynote. I'll talk more about that in the UWP session, about how you can get the best user engagement and ensure that as a developer, you're the most productive in building your app and trying to manage that process. Etienne also talked about some great stuff today using Azure subscriptions. I think that's definitely worth trying out if you're in the cloud or thinking of migrating. Give that a shot with Azure Pass. And finally, try out Microsoft Cognitive Services. Some of the APIs are really cool, especially the Vision one. That's my favorite. Uh, you should have a play and see what you think. So before I close off, I just want to give you a bit of an idea of what's going to happen for the rest of the day. So as you can see here, it's really busy. We're hopefully we're covering a lot of topics that you guys will be really interested in. Um, so we're going to start with Azure containers and, and things like that. And then from there, we'll go to the break. And uh, well, I hope they, you know. Hello, hello, folks. My name is Mr. Hoot from the Nosy Corporation. It's so annoying. It's unbelievable. I, I'll <laughs> let you know when I'm done here, Shen. <laughs> about a special workshop we're having tomorrow specifically based on Microsoft technologies. We have over 100 people registered already, but we still have seats available. How many folks are coming to join us tomorrow? Let's see a raise of hands. Let's see some more. Come on, come on. It's going to be great. What we're going to do is we're going to walk through some of the great technologies that we've been talking about today. we go. The stuff that you're learning today, we're going to be implementing tomorrow at the workshops. I'm going to give you opportunities to look at the newest Azure stuff, PWAs, Centennial, virtual reality, and Xamarin. We're going to have workshops for each of these to give you a chance to explore those technologies, learn new things, and maybe even win a prize at the end. So tomorrow morning clock. If you'd like to sign up, there's a registration table in the back, a guy with a big red shirt on. Maybe we'll give him some hair to wear as well that you can talk to, test out your computer, make sure it's ready, and sign up for the hack tomorrow. Hope to see you all there. And back to you, Shen. Thank you. <clears throat> yes. Thank you, Jeffrey. I told you I work with a bunch of clowns. Um, so this is what today is going to look like. So what we'd like to do is actually start the day off with some of your sessions. So please stay seated. Don't go anywhere, because he's going to just jump straight into it, straight after the keynote. And then uh, we'll walk through some of the great things across our cross-platform. We'll then have a lunch. And then again, please make sure you attend the game. It's going to be really fun. There'll be some cool stuff we'll give out there. And then we'll talk about some more about serverless, a bit about the UWP platform and the desktop bridge. And then we'll go to a Q&A where you can ask your questions. So thank you very much.
All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Chris Reisner. Uh, I'd just like to start by thanking everyone for joining us today at Build Tour. We're really excited that we're here. Uh, so the first session of the keynote, we're going to be talking about Azure containers and some of the work we've been doing uh, around tooling and support there. Before I start, quick show of hands. Who here is already doing container-based development? All right, great. So not a ton. So we're going to get started by kind of walking through what it is and why it's important. So a container, we really like to, to think of it in terms of the difference between a container and a virtual machine, because virtual machines, most people are kind of aware of what they are. So a container is really kind of like a VM, but without the actual operating system. It's basically your application, all of its source code, all of its config, the runtime, et cetera, that you can deploy somewhere without having to worry about that operating system layer. Now, if you think about a virtual machine, what it really does is it virtualizes the hardware. So somewhere down beneath, there's the CPU, the RAM, the network, all that stuff. But you don't really worry about that necessarily from a virtual machine perspective. You just get access to those resources as a virtual machine. And there's some issues with that. So first of all, that's a pretty large footprint whenever you're going to use a virtual machine. And as a result, the startup time can be quite slow. So when you compare that with a, with a container, now we're virtualizing the operating system, so we're not worrying about the operating system, and we're not worrying about the hardware beneath that as well. This leads us to have a much smaller footprint, which allows us to have a lot more application density, which we'll talk more about in just a second. This also means we've got a really fast startup time, and we're not waiting minutes or longer for virtual machines to start. So why are containers important? Why is Microsoft spending so much time talking about it and making it work really well in Azure? Well, number one for a lot of people is it's a lot cheaper to run containers than it is for virtual machines. If you think of kind of traditional application development with virtual machines, you would typically have maybe one application uh, on a virtual machine or on a set of virtual machines. And that way you're not scaling out multiple applications when you just want to scale out one VM or one set of VMs. Well, with containers, you don't have to worry about that because you're able to run multiple containers on the same VM or the same cluster of VMs, which means you can have a lot denser applications uh, or rather a denser use of that hardware uh, via the containers. You also get a lot of developer and DevOps efficiency boosts out of using containers. Since uh, the way containers are built or used is that uh, it should run pretty much the same no matter where you're running. Look at that runs on my computer issue that we're all so used to. It runs the same way when you're developing locally as it will when you're testing in a cloud or on a server as it will when you're in production. And all of these things combined enable you to have a lot more agility with your development. So kind of to kind of step back for a second, if you think about containers, there are concepts we look at. There's an image, which is kind of like a base. So here we've got a Docker file, which, just, which says that the base image is the Microsoft ASP, ASP.NET 4.6.2. When a container is built, it says, oh, this is what I'm using as the underlayer for the application. So it's kind of like a, a manifest or definition. Whereas the container, on the other hand, is an actual runtime instance of an image with your application on top of it. So if you're thinking about things in object-oriented terms, you could think of the image as the class and the container as an actual instance or an object of it. Now, containers are kind of like layers. So at the bottom of the layer is a kernel that's not really part of your actual image, but it is specified. Um, then you say what the base image is. So what is the operating system? Is it Debian? Is it Ubuntu? Is it Windows, et cetera? Then everything on top of that are uh, frameworks and installations. So it might be Emacs, and then on top of that, Apache. It might be IIS and Node. Um, and then actually, the top layer is your application code itself. Now, when you start with containers, you probably will end up just developing one. But eventually, you get into architectures where you've got multiple uh, containers as part of an application. Again, one of the ideas of a container is that it should compose one part of your application, not a whole application. So when you start doing multiple containers, you need to be able to compose them. And one way you do that is through Docker Compose and Composition. So here we have an example of where there's two separate containers that are part of one application, and they're specified in our Compose file, which enables us to specify how we deploy and run our application. So now we'll take a look at specifically what Microsoft is doing to support containerization. The first thing we'll talk about is containers on Windows and the work there. If you kind of go back in time a little bit, and you're familiar, you've probably heard of Docker, it was all Linux-based containers. We kind of got something to understand the value in how containers work, so we started working on with Windows itself. So the first type of containers for Windows are Windows Server containers. And here what happens is the kernel is shared across all of your containers, 
And it uses uh, namespace and process technology to determine what container is what. On the other side, we've got Hyper-V containers. And here, the kernel is not actually shared. Instead, a super-optimized, slimmed-down virtual machine runs each container. And what's really great about that is it's really meant for the scenario where you have multi-tenant applications uh, where you want to make sure there's no impact between different containers. Now, I want to take you for a quick demo of what it looks like when we have uh, containers on Windows Server. All right, we'll just hop over here. All right, so here I am. I'm in a virtual machine. It is running on Azure, but it's running Windows Server 2016 with container support. And I'm just going to use a couple commands to show us running uh, an image on top of Windows using Nano Server, which is really a slimmed down version of Windows Server. So the first thing I'll do is I'll use the Docker command line tooling to look at the different images I've got. Now, we've done a lot of work to make sure the Docker command line tooling works just as well with Windows containers as it does with Linux-based containers. So we can already see here I've got two images installed. I've got Windows Server. I've got that nano server. If you look at the far right side, you're going to notice a drastic difference in the size of these. Again, that nano server is a very slimmed down version of our uh, operating system. So now I'm just going to start a container, and we're going to look at kind of the difference between what we're running, Windows Server, and the nano server. So what I'm doing is I'm saying run a nano server instance, and I want to run the command, or the command line inside of this uh, container. So we'll give it just a few seconds, and we should start up our container. All right, so now we have the command line just running. Again, this is a really simplified example. Uh, you know, usually we're building out application architectures with web apps and things like that, but this will accomplish our purpose here. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to see the number of processes running as part of my nano server. So what we'll see back in just a second is that we've got around, I think it's going to be 16 or so. Oh, 19, sorry. So we've got about 19 processes running inside this now server. Now, if we exit back out and we turn to PowerShell, which it doesn't really indicate that visually, but I, we're back in PowerShell, uh, we can run the same thing here. And again, this is us back running on our Windows server. So now when we run this, we see the nine processes. So this is just a start to some of the slim down stuff we've done on nano server to make it really run well in the cloud. So the next thing we'll talk about is really containers on Azure. And there's a few different ways containers on Azure work. The first one is app service. Now, if people have been using app service for a while, they're probably familiar with running web apps and maybe mobile apps and logic apps and things like that on top of app service. But it's also possible to run a container on app service. And when you do that, you get to take advantage of all the capabilities that app service provides. So the enterprise grade level of scalability and support for hybrid infrastructure as well as high availability and things like that. It's, it's fully managed. Again, you're not worrying about operating systems or patching or anything like that. And it really gives you a, a high level of productivity. Now, the next way of doing containers on Azure is something called Service Fabric. What's really great about Service Fabric is that it works on Azure, it works on premise, and it works on other clouds. You can host Linux and Windows containers here. And it, in addition, a lot of the major Azure services are actually built on top of Azure Service Fabric. So things like uh, Cosmos DB, which Etienne mentioned during the keynote, uh, Skype for Business, uh, Data Lake, a bunch of other services are all built on top of Service Fabric. Then the last item on here is Azure Container Service, or ACS. And what Azure Container Service allows us to do is when we get to that point where we've got many different containers and we need to control them and make sure they're being deployed to the different virtual machines in a cluster well, ACS will set up an orchestrator for us that handles all of that. Uh, it also gives us the ability to have a container registry, so we have our own private of containers and images, and then also handles some monitoring. And we're going to look more at ACS and Service Fabric in a minute. Now, 
I want to walk through the different, the kind of like container ecosystem from the very bottom all the way to the top for, for a minute. At the very bottom, you've got the operating system. As I mentioned before, Windows supports uh, containers as well as Linux. Above that, you've got the different tooling that you can use to kind of control those containers. Now, a minute ago, you saw me using the CLI in the Windows server, the Docker tooling, and that works with both Windows and Linux containers. There's also support within the PowerShell and command line CLI for Windows, and there's also support via Rocket. Now, the next level up is the registry. And the registry is really where all of those images are stored. So that Docker file we saw earlier on where it specified ASP.NET 4.6.2, that's an image that's part of the Docker Hub or part of a registry. You can also use the Azure Container Registry to store your own images, so sort of like a private registry. Then there's a matter of hosting. So we saw we can host containers on Windows Server. We can do it on App Service. We can do it on Service Fabric. And now this is where we talk about orchestrators. So when you have many different containers and you want to be able to manage those on a cluster, what you do is you use something like Docker Swarm or Kubernetes or DCOS. What these systems do for you is they ensure that as your application needs to be scaled out and scaled down, it's doing that appropriately across your VMs. So earlier I mentioned the density and how it's really great because you can run multiple containers on a virtual machine as opposed to just a single application. These are really what allow you to do that, because they control making sure that the right amount of uh, containers are deployed to each virtual machine in your cluster so that you are achieving as mo the maximum amount of density and getting the most out of the hardware that you're paying for. And the last bit here is that ACS system. And that really is what will help you spin up the Docker Swarm, the Kubernetes, and the DCOS. So it makes it really easy to get your clusters up and running. So I want to walk through kind of the containerized dev workflow. And it's going to look very familiar to kind of what a typical dev workflow is. It's just containing some additional stuff for the container stuff. Now at the start, we're always doing development. We're usually doing that in a local place. And we want to make sure that when we're done, we can push that out, and it's going to function the same way everywhere else. Um, one of the things that we can depend on as part of this process is that Azure Container Registry for storing images. So as we develop, we use a source control system. Maybe it's Visual Studio Team Services. Maybe it's another Git repository system somewhere else. As we push code out, we want to use Docker and continuous integration to build out our, our new images and our new containers. And if they're images, we want to push them back into the registry. And then as we go forward, we want to use continuous delivery to then deploy our applications. And whether that's to Service Fabric, uh, to App Service, to the virtual machines, or to whichever orchestrator we have running through Azure Container Service. And the last piece of the puzzle is monitoring. We want to be able to monitor our applications, monitor our containers, make sure everything is healthy and running well. And that feeds back into a continuous improvement cycle of doing development and pushing new code out. Now, before we jump into the demo, I want to say that we've just recently launched some new container tools in Visual Studio 2017. Now, what's really great about this is it gives us a lot of abilities inside of Visual Studio to run, debug, and test our container applications right from Visual Studio. We can do breakpoint debugging. We can edit and refresh our code. And we can also scale out our Docker assets. So let's go ahead and take a look at this happening in action. So here I am in Visual Studio. I've got a basic application that has two different web projects. There's a CRM service, and there's a web application. Now what I want to do is I want to Dockerize this so I can start running it through Docker locally and then deploy it two containers running in Azure later on. So I'm going to right click here on my web project. I'm going to go to Add. And I will go to Docker Support. And what this is doing is it's creating the Docker files. It's creating the Docker Compose. It's creating everything I need to actually deploy this application into Docker. Now I'm going to jump over to where I already have this application running in Visual Studio. Now if you look on the left side, we've got one controller. On the right side, there's a different controller. One of these is part of that web application, and one of these part of the CRM application. Now, these are being deployed into different containers when I run this inside of Docker. So over here, I've got that web application. This is the Visitors app. I'm just going to click here on this clock. And what we should see is we hit a debug breakpoint. This is in container one. What I love about the tooling that we built into Visual Studio now is that when I continue here, I hit the debug breakpoint in a completely separate container. So now we can do multi-container debugging all from Visual Studio. It's really great. The next thing I'll highlight here is that we can right click on our solution and set up continuous delivery. And when we do that, we have the choice to, right now, between Service Fabric and then the different app service between Linux and Windows. Later on, we're going to add more capabilities so you'll be able to choose Kubernetes right from there. Now, if we move over to the portal, 
or rather the, the VSTS, we can see here that when we set that up that continuous integration, we create a continuous integration process inside Visual Studio Team Services. This is going to deal with building out my solution, doing all the deploying, and then putting stuff into the registry all for me. Once that's done and I'm happy, I can then go to my release definition where I can tell it to go ahead and deploy to service fabric. All very easily done with just a click and a few things of uh, text. Once I've deployed that, I then get a similar sort of dashboard that we saw before where I can see all the different pieces of my application, uh, all the stats on the containers, whether it's container CPU stats or the disk stats, et cetera. And then what I also get with Service Fabric is all of the different nodes and their health. So we can see that everything is healthy. We can see uh, what domains they're part of to make sure that my application continues to run and runs well. So I encourage everyone to take a look at Microsoft.com slash containers and understand what you can do with containers yourself. And then also to go on hub.docker.com and read about more about what you can do with Docker. We're super excited about how you can containerize your applications and how you can build better, faster, and more efficient applications on top of the cloud. So I'm going to go ahead now and hand things over to Andy Wigley, who's going to tell you more about what's new with AI and Azure. Thanks very much. Yeah. Hi, everybody. How are you doing? Fine. Great. All right. So um, I'm a senior software development engineer in our technical evangelism and development group. So and today, I'm going to run you through uh, just an introduction to a couple of new features we've got in cognitive services. So at Microsoft, we believe that AI is about amplifying human ingenuity. Now, we've created cognitive services as a bunch of cloud services that enable you to build AI features into your application and available to all developers. You don't just have to be you know, a, a deep computer scientist to use these things. These are accessible services available to everyone. So we launched Microsoft Cognitive Services around about two years ago with just four APIs initially. And now it's grown to around 29. Uh, in these different categories around vision, a speech, uh, linguistic analysis, language, knowledge services, and search. Uh, and they're gaining rapid acceptance by developers across the world who are building these uh, features, in, AI features into their applications using these services. But why, why use Microsoft Cognitive Services? Well, the first thing is they're really easy to use. All of these are just REST services. So few simple lines of code. You can call these services and to make use of them. And you, it's really easy to get started. Just go to www.microsoft.com slash cognitive. You don't have to go searching all, in lots of different places. Everything you need is right there. And they're super flexible. We've got a breadth of services in there. So developers can find the service they need. Uh, and they're really easy because they're REST services, really easy to integrate. So developers can uh, build them, uh, build it into their apps, be they Windows, Android, or iOS, or, or web services and web apps, using the language, the framework, the platform of their choice, and using the tools that they love, be it C Sharp .NET, or uh, Python, or, or Node.js, or a host of others. So really, really easy to, uh, to, to use these things. And these are, these are top quality services. They are built and designed and backed by our top computerists out of Microsoft Research and out of our Bing and our Azure Machine Learning groups. Uh, so they're, they're a comprehensive set of services with uh, features there for everyone. So we really have, we try to democratize AI with these services, bringing it to every developer. And since we launched, uh, over half a million uh, developers have taken advantage of our cognitive services. So it's the broadest and the deepest set of developer services for AI in the industry. These are great services in here, such as face recognition, uh, emotion analysis. We saw some of this. Sentiment analysis that we saw in the TAC demo. Um, linguistic analysis. So you can have, obviously, natural language analysis is a big part of this, where you can take uh, speech or, or typed natural language text and, and determine the user's intent of what they really meant. Um, translation services, um, speaker recognition. So you can have uh, a or a service where somebody is speaking and you can recognize who the speaker is. 
Um, we've got a whole lot of search services around image, web, video, and academic knowledge and uh, all our knowledge services. Um, Q&A Maker is a really great one where you can take a database of frequently asked questions and turn it into an easily searchable service that you can use uh, to build sort of help desk applications and that kind of thing. We've also released at Build a new video indexer service which combines factors around face and vision and semantic understanding to, uh, to index video content. And also services lab. So this is your chance to get really early access to some of the newest services that we are developing. Uh, and you can work alongside our teams and help kind of prove out new ones. The initial ones around there are about gesture understanding um, and also about um, uh, walk instructions and, and uh, route logistics, that kind of thing. Now, we've been talking to, uh, to many of our uh, developers and asking them what they like and what they'd like to see. And the message has come through very loud and clear. What developers want and need is custom services. So our broad services are great for a lot of, of applications, but what you really want in a lot of scenarios are custom AI APIs which allows customers to use their own data backed by our algorithms to create customized services that are to their specific needs. So you can custom train these services to your own scenarios while still making them they're still accessible through simple REST calls, just the same as the other ones, uh, without the need to design very, very complex models. So using these services, it makes it much easier to develop your own AI applications. So let's look at, uh, at one of these services, the custom vision service. OK, so um, this first of all, have a look at our version 1 API, the custom vision API. So this is our generic uh, image recognition service. Um, and you can test it out in the portal here. We can analyze an image. And you can see here it tells you how you can use it. And uh, we get a nice little uh, uh, content here. We put in a subscription key. I've set up a key in the Azure portal uh, for my account previously. And I, that's been plugged into there. And then you can supply an image, either a raw image binary or an image URL. So I've actually got um, over here an image of a rhododendron leaf. So I'm just going to copy the URI of that and plug that right into this, into here. OK, so uh, you can see there, I've just plugged that into, the, into the, uh, the body that's going to be sent to this service. And then we can actually give that a call and see what it comes back with. So we send that off to the, uh, the REST endpoint. So we're testing out this API here. Uh, and you can see down here that it tells us that it has said, OK, this is an image of plant leaves. Well, that's true. Um, but actually, for our application, we want to be a bit more specific than that. We want to know not that it's just a plant, but actually what we want to know is exactly what plant it is. So over to our new custom vision service. I've got this plant. I've got, this is the home page where you can create your applications, your projects. Um, and this plants one here, um, we expanded out. Now, the way you do this is you simply upload your data so a, a few dozen images is all you need to get started. And then you need to tag these images so that the system You have to tag these images so that so the system understands what it is. So uh, you can have a look at these and see that this has been tagged as a T. camellia, um, and there's a whole bunch of other you can use to help ca categorize what the image is. And once you've got all your images, you just have to hit this big green button up here to train your image. And this is training and building a, a, building a, 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 a language, natural, uh, an AI-backed application in the cloud and creating your endpoint. So uh, we can give this a quick test, and we can pop in that, the image uh, URI for that rhododendron again. And then we can hit go and see what it comes up. So that's now sending that off. And down here, now we can see that it actually has get a 99.3% probability that 
indeed a rhododendron. So, uh, so you can see that that's working, and we're now getting specific results back to our leaf um, uh, analysis application. Now, what about uh, you know the normal kind of as people use this application? Um, how can we kind of improve it as time goes on? So we've got you covered there as well. So here's this predictions thing. Now, we just built a new iteration, so there's no, no kind of examples in there. But if we go back to the earlier one, which people have been using, now, as people send images up and use your, your AI-backed application, the system will categorize them. And the ones it knows about, it will obviously give that like the 99.3% probability. That's good. But where there's other ones where it's kind of not so sure, it will stick them in, and using a, a clever, clever algorithm behind it, will, it will put them into this um, predictions pane. So you can come along periodically and have a look at what's in here. Uh, and you can see that the predictions of these are, are pretty low percentages. Cypress are 14% or a fern. Um, but we can actually go into here. And now you can actually say, well, actually, that, you, know, that is, uh, you, know, you can actually choose, say, OK, that is a fern. And so you can actually put, tag these and help the system to improve over time. Uh, and you give it tags, and then you save it, and then you uh, retrain re your model. So periodically, every so often you do this, your model is getting better based on real life application. Um, and a lot of our services work the same way, the custom language and all the rest of those. So that's a quick look at the custom vision service. Lost my slides here. Just a minute. Sorry, we, we lost the we lost the demo machine. So I'm just going to have to try and. Uh, huh? Yeah. Okay. All right. So what we're going off and just uh, get up to where we were. OK, so that was the custom vision service. Um, just talk a little bit about one of our other custom services that's very popular. The custom speech service is really interesting. So this, again, our, our regular language understanding service is really good for general uh, language understanding. So this is for situations where you want to take a natural language query from a user. So they're typing into a, a chat window or something. And you've got maybe a bot at the back that's trying to figure out what the user wants. And that works really great for uh, general situations. But for, for certain applications, you want to need to have you know, custom language models. So these are where you have tailored the, uh, the vocabulary that it's looking for to a specific uh, domain, be it a, uh, uh, legal terms or medical terms. So you can give it a, a own series of utterances that are custom to your solution and train this custom speech service. You can also do interesting things around custom acoustic models. So if your application is going to be used in challenging environments, so there's a lot of noise, there's a great demo of you know how if you're in an airport and over the loudspeaker announcement, some of them are clear and some of them are not so good, so there's a lot of background noise. You can actually train your, acoustic, your model acoustically to work better in those scenarios. Or other situations such as children's speech which have, they have their own unique way of speaking, which is kind of uh, difficult for the generic service to understand. But once you've defined, you can define your custom speech model and then just deploy that in the same way as we saw with the, uh, with the other ones to a REST endpoint. Uh, and it's really then easily accessible from your applications through regular REST calls. All right, so let's, um, let's talk a little bit about bots. Um, now, bots and AI are often talk, talked about in the same breath. Actually, bots are not, they don't require AI services, but they often incorporate them because um, bots, chat bots, are often in, deployed in situations where people are typing into a chat window or, or speaking. So natural language understanding, AI features become uh, a real part of that. So let's have a typical layout of a bot. So it, a bot is just a web service. It is just a REST web service itself. And your code sits there up on, on Azure Web Service or something. Uh, and you might hope your bot will be built on top of the bot builder SDK. And of course, your bot code is just sitting there waiting for 
TTP requests are come in, and then it responds to them. It's, it's no different from any other web application in that sense. But of course, you can call out to other Azure services, such as uh, and databases, or Azure Machine Learning, or Azure Search. And you can also call into the Microsoft Cognitive Services for doing language understanding, translation, for example. Um, so it could come back in Finnish. Um, you can do face and vision and emotion. All those, all those cognitive services are available to you. But then the kind of clever bit is the bit in the middle at the top there, the bot connector service. So this allows you to write your bot code once. And the bot connector service kind of acts as a sort of a protocol converter, if you like, and allows your bot to operate on all of these different channels over on the right there. Uh, and we have a lot of channels available to the, to the bot framework. In fact, we announced a couple of new ones at Build, which was Cortana Skills in the US uh, for Bing and, um, uh, and for um, Skype for Business. So new, uh, and for, uh, new, new channels there available to you. Uh, and this is your bot code working like that. Now, when you talk about, um, technology is not working for me today. And now this is frozen. OK, that's good. So um, as far as designing uh, bots is concerned, you know, um, apps and websites, design patterns for those are well understood. Um, but the, um, we're with bots, really, we, it's kind of a very new technology. So we're kind of, uh, kind of sort of still figuring that out, to be honest. And a lot of the design patterns we have been establishing, working with a lot of you in, in uh, hack events and building out solutions, and we're all learning about the best patterns that work. Uh, and we've documented all of these at this URI, http colon whack whack aka.ms bot design. Uh, so if you go there, there's a whole list of, uh, of different, um, uh, different uh, design patterns, and you can learn a lot about how you would design these things. A quick look at some of these patterns. First of all, let's look, talk about the knowledge-based bot. This is where you have a bot that has a big corpus of information, a big database. And what you're doing here is you're enabling a bot to allow people to efficiently search into that data and get the answer they need. So this would be a help, a conference or an event bot, a help desk kind of thing and that sort of thing, or a contact lookup, these kind of big, big search-based applications. So this is a fairly simple kind of a bot, but that works very efficiently over, um, over big amounts of data. And the Q&A maker I mentioned before is often a good tool for helping to build out this kind of pattern. You can talk, this kind of bot would often call into the Bing knowledge graph. Now, the Bing knowledge graph, Bing knows about billions of different entities and also the connections between them and the relationships. So it makes it really easy for developers to ask questions like, who is Bill Gates? And it will come back with a nice curated response from Wikipedia or somewhere and give you information on that. But then you can also follow up. The user can follow up and say, and who is his wife? And in the, the knowledge graph is intelligent enough to know that, understand the context and know that his, in this case, refers to the previous request, which was Bill Gates. So it can give you the correct responses. What about the, uh, the kind of situation of um, a, a help desk? Now, this is why every, every company needs this kind of, of scenario. So this is a really common pattern. Um, so if you think about a help desk kind of application, the first bit of the, of the whole process is to ask for all the information. You know, what is your name? What is your phone number? What's your problem? And then once you've got that information, only then can you sort of route the request onto the next stage of processing to give them the response and information that they need. Now, this is a great, uh, one, this is a great application for bots to get involved at this point of things, because that repairing, you don't want customers ending, waiting on the line because you haven't got a human operator available at that time. You can automate that bit very easily and let the bot gather that initial information and get that triage. So the bot can come up and so, uh, get to the point of saying, OK, what's your problem? Um, and then at this point, the, the, 
we need to kind of make a decision about what happens at next. Now, it may be that the solution is quite a simple and repetitive one, like, oh, I, I forgot my password. I need to reset my password. So this is a very repetitive kind of operation. And we, the response to this is very well understood. We know how to handle this. First of all, you know you have to establish the uh, user's identity. Then you call an API to reset uh, the password. And then you give them, the end user some way of getting them to change their password. Now, these steps are kind of, we know all about this. This is what we call a recipe. And if it's a recipe of, of well understood steps, this is a great candidate for automating the whole process end to end. And this is something that a bot could easily be written to handle these kind of things. Um, and the user, the, a real human operator, doesn't really need to get involved with that. So that's a simple and repetitive solution. But there, are, there will come a point in asking the user what their problem is that the bot will not have the knowledge to help. So it's a more one where you need a human operator. So this is great uh, because up to this point, your human operators are still are being kept there available to handle the, the more complex things, and they can use their human ingenuity and all of the knowledge that they have in order to help handle these more complex ones. Uh, but you freed them up, and they're not time doing the sim real simple stuff. So there's two ways of handing off to the human there. First of all, there's the complete handoff. This is really simple. This is where the bot simply says, OK, I'm connecting you to this operator. And the bot just steps out of the conversation then and doesn't have any further involvement. The human operator completely takes and resolves the end user's problem. So that's kind of simple, a complete handoff. But actually more interesting than that is what we call a supervised bot to human handoff. This is a model we've been developing recently, uh, which is really good. Because at some point, the, the bot will get to a point where, OK, there's, there's some ambiguity how we need to handle this. So you've got two player, three players in this, if you like. You've got the end user is talking to the bot, but the human operator is also monitoring what's going on from the bot, but the bot is still staying in the conversation. The user is still talking to the bot. But at this point, the bot will say to the operator, uh, OK, tell me what to do at this point. Should I apologize to the user? Should I suggest a hardware service? Or do you want to just take over and, and kind of handle this? So at this point, the uh, operator can choose, and I either choose one of the first two, like suggest a hardware service, um, or they can come in and actually type and take over. This is a really important kind of uh, situation, um, which uh, allows repeti repetition and, uh, and a good quality response. Uh, the end user is happy, and you end up with a, getting a good quality uh, uh, service for, for the end user. And also, you can learn over time you know, uh, and watch the, you get your analytics. And you can o learn over time and improve the bot if things are starting to turn into a recipe. So you continuously improve your application. Uh, another very common pattern is the bot to web. This is where you uh, need to call out from the bot out of the chat and put up a web window for something. The classical example of this is custom authentication. So the custom auth is a very typical one where you would put up a link in the chat window. The user clicks on it. It launches out the web. And then the user goes through a flow with the web page, which might be to authenticate. At some, at the, some point, the web flow will have completed. And at that point, we can return control back to the bot. But the clever thing here is that underneath, there's a, a, a back communication channel going on between the web page and the bot, so that the web page is able to inform the bot about what's happened and the result and the information that's important for the bot to then continue the, uh, the conversation with the end user. Um, the other one is app bots. Some, some bots are pretty, don't need to have much of a conversation, don't need to have much chat. They might be, they don't look that different actually from an app. They have, might have rich UI with buttons and this kind of stuff. Um, and we often, in our documentation, we often to developers that if, if you're not sure how to design a particular interaction as a bot, well, just forget that it's a bot and think of it as an app, because actually, there's not an all huge amount of difference between these. Bots are apps. Um, they just have a particular style. Um, so you, you can actually uh, kind of just think of terms of, of buttons and, uh, uh, and this kind of thing. Uh, and re reducing the need for the end user to type is a real big uh, benefit in these kind of things. Um, the last one I want to talk about is proactive messages. So typically, a bot is just a REST service. It sits there, waits for a message, responds to it, um, and, then, uh, and, then, uh, th and then 
the conversation carries on. Um, but sometimes you might start a flow that is very long running, or the user has expressed an interest to say, OK, notify me when something has happened. So in this case, the bot needs to actually send an unsolicited message. Um, but the, in writing this, you obviously need to store in a database the Azure tables or SQL Azure, Azure or something um, the identity of the user who requested it and the contextual information. So the bot needs to keep track of those user addresses. And when this event at some point in the future happens, it can proactively send a message out which will turn up in the channel where the user connected. Um, so this is just a little code snippet that shows you how you might do that. Um, to send a proactive message to a particular address through the Bot Builder APIs. Um, the other things people say is, how can I uh, help my bot to learn? How can I get my bot to learn to do better? Um, well, learning is a very overloaded term. The key thing here with all these things is information. You need to be gathering data. You certainly can't improve the operation of your bot unless you are analyzing, you've, got, you've instrumented your bot, you're gathering data. Now, fortunately here, all the standard kind of uh, tools we have, App Insights, Power BI, and uh, the back storage are all available for you to instrument your bots. They're just web apps in just the same way. So you need to gather information about how users are interacting with your service. And then they learn through you actually uh, um, iterating and improving the, uh, the way that the thing operates. Um, so at this point, I just want to show you a quick video. Uh, combining a good few features of, the, uh, of what I've been talking about. So if you could please uh, roll the uh, Zembo video. Hey, Zembo, look. I think I'm seeing a drawing. What is it? It's a picture of Isaac Newton. According to wikipedia.org, Isaac Newton was an English mathematician, astronomer, and physicist who is widely recognized as one of the most influential scientists of all time and a key figure in the scientific revolution. When was he born? Isaac Newton was born on December 25, 1642. Wow! You look surprised. Did I get it right? Yes, you did, Zembo. Can you draw another picture? Yes, I'll draw another picture of Neil Armstrong. Great. What do you think? Pretty cool, huh? So can we go back to the slides? So our switch seems to, hey, there we go. OK. All right. So um, you saw there was some interesting things in that. So that was a robot, which is not the same as a bot. Sounds the same, but it's actually not the same. But it just so happens that the software running on that robot, which is Zembo, built by Asus, um, actually has bot as part of its software solution running in the cloud behind it. Uh, and there's a load of interesting things going on there. First of all, there's a custom speech service we've built to help understand how children speak, because they have their own unique language. As I'm sure most of you know, that sometimes when your children are talking to you, you have not the faintest idea what they're saying. Um, but you know, so you can develop a custom speech service to help understand how, what they're saying. There's also a lot of other interesting things going on. As the, as the user is interacting with Zembo, we are capturing images. Uh, and storing them up in the cloud in Azure storage. And then we are running those images against services, against the custom vision, the face, the emotion thing, so we can, we can look at the user and see if they're surprised and this sort of thing. And, uh, and we are using the language understanding service to understand the basic questions and that sort of thing. Um, and we also got the knowledge graph in there, so when the user, end user about Neil Armstrong or Isaac Newton, the bot can come back, the robot can come back and give the user real good information that it's got from the Bing knowledge graph. So a lot of features in there that kind of combine a lot of those good things that uh, I've been talking about here. All right, so I'm just going to close with a 
talk about a little bit of cards. So cards are those bits of UI. This, this is, if you just create, you can create a bot that's just text-based, but that's kind of boring. And if you've got a screen available, then what you want to do is have some visuals. Uh, but it, web developers will tell you that the, the real challenge for anybody develop, using UI is, the, is making sure that you skin your UI for all the different places where it can be accessed. And bots are no different. So we have all those different channels in, in the bot framework. Um, and different clients have different ways of showing a UI visual content. This is how Twitter shows a, a nice graphical image in the, uh, as a post there. So you get the image and all the layout. And it's all defined with this, um, these meta tags uh, that you have to send up to Twitter to get it to show something like that. Whereas Facebook is really quite different. This time it's JSON. And you've got this particular format, this, this kind of schema that you have to conform to to get a, a very nice looking uh, upcoming flight card in Facebook. But they, they're all different. They're, they have their different ways of expressing these kind of things. So what about making something better? So the thing about bots has always been this, what we're trying to do with bots is this, this holy grail of write once, run anywhere. Hey, haven't we been trying to do that for decades? But it's the same with bots. We're trying to make sure that we keep the developer's work to a minimum, but get the maximum possible usage out of it. So we want something that's different from the, the two extremes of the real fixed templates, the kind of channel-specific formats that you have to conform to. And the end user's got very little control. The developer's got very little control over what it looks like. The channel kind of maintains the style and the security context. Going to the other extreme, which would be a, an HTML canvas, which is like, hey, anything goes. But then you've got no consistency in the channel. Identity can get lost. So what we really want is something in the middle where we can uh, actually allow the developer to define what they want to show, but not specifically allow the channels to kind of format it. So we want this kind of in nice in-between situation uh, which would allow uh, the developer to, to handle a lot of these things in a very generic, easy way. And that is adaptive cards. We've defined adaptive cards as a framework which is intended not to cover every single scenario. You can still obviously drop down to channel customizations for, for edge cases. But we want it to cover 80% of the general situations, um, which you can just code up once and let the channel get on with it. So we've defined a framework. It's up on GitHub um, with, with uh, different renderers for the different cards on the different channels. Um, and you can define your content just once and have it render appropriately across the different kind of channels. We also got great tooling in the uh, Adaptive Cards uh, framework. We've got a visualizer, interactive visualizer that allows you to, to look at how your, co your, 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 your code for the card is going to appear on different channels. We've got a schema explorer so you can uh, dig down into how it, how it is. And also got a plugin for Visual Studio Code to allow you to view your, 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 your Adaptive Cards right within the uh, code environment. So let's have a quick look at. Uh, at this. So here's the Microsoft Bot Framework home page. And you can see here we've got all of these different channels. And this is, this is where the complexity is starting to come in. We've got skills and, uh, uh, and Skype for Business and Microsoft Teams and Bing and Skype and uh, Kick and Facebook Messenger and all these kind of different kind of channels. Um, and this is where the complexity is coming, where we want to be able to define UI visual content that can uh, show on all of those. So we've got up on GitHub, you can go up and here, you can, this is all of the source, everything for uh, that, that, that we've got for the Adaptive Cards framework, including uh, uh, samples and, uh, and uh, a little bit of information. Um, but you see that the real example, the kind of developer tools for this is at adaptivecards.io. This is adaptivecards.io. Um, and you can see here that we've got, uh, this is where you can ex uh, explore the, the Adaptive Cards framework uh, much more, uh, including the documentation, the Schema Explorer. And here's the Visualizer. So we launch into the Visualizer, and you can actually see how uh, these different kind of uh, cards are, are defined. So here we've got an example. You can see that you simply define your cards as saying, OK, I've got an item here that's a text block. Um, and the text value is this card created here. Um, and you've got a weight that's bolder. 
um, and size that is medium and that uh, kind of thing. Really simple, and underneath that we've got a column set, which is a bit like a table. So you've got an auto-sized column and a stretch column. Um, and this, this, this is the first auto column, and that's the stretch, which is the rest of that table. And there is that header. And you can see that um, this is how it's going to be looking. This particular card will appear with Microsoft Teams. Uh, this is what a Windows Toast notification for the same thing would look like. Um, we can drop down and have a look in Skype. You know, and so you can actually, um, uh, in, and in Slack. So all of these are, um, are defined in here, and you can see what they look like. And you'll notice this speak this card, because speech is a very much an emerging uh, technology. Um, before long, we may not be typing quite so much, and we're speaking much more to our computer systems. Adaptive cards has been designed to cover all of those situations as well. So in this session, I've shown you through. We've seen a demo of the custom vision service. If you want to find out more about that, please go to aka.mscustomvision. Uh, the speech service, very popular and very interesting, aka.ms custom speech. Um, and in more general terms, if you want to find out more about our artificial intelligence uh, products, please go to microsoft.com slash AI. OK, so that brings us to the break. Um, we're just going to take, um, if we can be back, please, at 11.30. We've got a couple of sessions that take us up to lunch, uh, going to cover web apps and .NET and Xamarin. OK, thanks very much, and enjoy the rest of the day.